once around Epsilon Lyra. So this is a favorite of mine for our observing sessions. Epsilon Lyra, just to the left of the bright star Vega. Um, this makes it the fifth brightest star in the constellation of Lyra, but often overlooked, in fact, um, because the brightness of its near neighbor Vega at magnitude zero is so uh, overpowering. It's relatively nearby, 160 light years, so not quite in the sun's backyard, but it's nevertheless not a very distant star. And that gives us the opportunity to see it in quite uh, reasonable detail. With a pair of binoculars, when you look at Epsilon, you immediately notice that there are two components, Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2. These are 208 arc seconds apart. So that's a significant fraction of a degree. And the reason for that is that they're 10,000 astronomical units separated from each other in an orbit that takes 400,000 years to rotate. So not a spectator sport watching them go round. But nevertheless, it's an interesting object to look at with binoculars or indeed a small telescope. And if you have a small telescope, and good seeing conditions, or perhaps slightly better equipment, then you notice that each of the two components are themselves double. So Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2 are both double stars. And the two subcomponents are just 2.5 arc seconds apart. So you do need quite good conditions and quite good optics to be able to see these as separate. So a nice photograph of them there, and another one here showing the two primary components and then inset the splits of each of them. And they are at right angles to each other like this. So um, that's their current position angle. For the Epsilon 1 pair, you've got a brighter Mag 4.7 and a fainter 6.2 uh, orbiting around each other, 184 astronomical units, the Earth-Sun distance um, apart, and they take 1,800 years or so to go round. And the Epsilon-2 pair are a little bit more equal, both magnitude 5, and a little bit uh, more rapid. They go round in 725 years. And so since observations of these have been made, we have noticed that the position angle on the sky, the uh, line between them, is rotating around uh, for both of these pairs, it's uh, enough that we can measure it. So all four of the stars, rather than going through them individually, uh, because they're actually very similar, they're in the range of two times the sun's mass, 1.61 for the small faint one, up to 2.15 for the largest, brightest one. And we classify them in the white star category, uh, F0, A3, A6, and A7, so um, fairly similar to each other. The the F star is the uh, coolest and the lightest weight. That has a temperature just over 7,000 Kelvin, and the others, it's getting on for 8,000, so definitely um, in the white region of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And these are modestly young stars, just 800 million years old, so much, much younger than our sun. And, uh, of course, that makes sense because stars that are double the mass are going to live about six times less in terms of their lifetime. Right? So rather than surviving for 10 billion years, as our sun will, these guys are going to uh, have a lifetime of about one and a half billion years, perhaps. And so 800 million puts them halfway through their evolutionary cycle. And so we see this double-double with our telescopes and uh, love projecting it onto the screen for the public observing evenings that we do because uh, it's quite unusual. But there is a fifth component to this double-double, so we should perhaps think up a new name for it. And this fifth star orbits one of the stars in the Epsilon-2 pairing. Now, I haven't got a full image of this. It's detected by speckle interferometry 
back in 1985. Back in the 80s, speckle interferometry was the way ahead, and it relied on taking rapid images of the sky of high resolution, looking at stars and seeing the dot of the star dance around across the sensor of your camera. And if you were quick enough at taking the images, you could catch a much higher resolution set of frames. Uh, that's been followed up more recently. Nowadays, we do what's called lucky imaging for all kinds of things, not just individual stars, but uh, planets, galaxies, and everything, where computer techniques are able to take out the t uh, wobble and the turbulence caused by the Earth's atmosphere. So this was uh, found in this way back in the 80s. And it's very, very close indeed. The orbit is just tens of years. And the separation, just 0 0.1 arc seconds. That's very tight indeed. Typical atmospheric conditions for amateur astronomy mean that the best you could hope for is uh, perhaps uh, a third of an arc second in resolution. So this is beyond the capabilities of uh, most, uh, even the best amateur equipment. That's why I don't have an image of it. Um, but just to put that in context, an arc second is a 60th of a minute, which is a 60th of a degree. Um, so this is one thirty-six thousandth of a degree separation. That's uh, uh, amazingly tight indeed. And the reason that we struggle, not only because of the atmospheric turbulence, but because of the nature of our optics, is all down to the phenomenon of optical diffraction. If you have light passing through an aperture, then it has a tendency to spread out. And the smaller the aperture, the wider the angle that it will uh, spread. So, in fact, the uh, aim of having a larger collecting area not only makes your image brighter, but it gives you this wider diameter and therefore less of a diffraction effect on the images. Here's a picture of a laser beam being passed through a tiny hole. And this is creating a set of very wide diffraction rings, interference of the waves of the coherent laser light coming through the hole, through the pinhole, just 90 micrometers across, and creating a dot in the center surrounded by what's called the airy disk, a set of interference rings of constructive and destructive interference alternating. And so actually this rather limits your ability to get the finest resolution because even that central region is larger than the uh, dot that you're looking for. If you make two holes in your piece of uh, uh, screen and you bring them closer and closer together, then the airy disks from the two will merge together and at a certain point you get an image like uh, the one at the bottom there where it becomes impossible to tell that there were in fact two separate objects at all and this is the diffraction limit. Now for typical optical telescopes used by amateur astronomers we have a formula for this called the Dawes limit invented by the Reverend William Rutter Dawes, a very famous British uh, astronomer. We have one of the telescopes um, in one of the domes that used to belong to Dawes, actually on site in Cambridge. It's an eight and a half inch refractor, a very nice instrument indeed. But Dawes worked out that there was a rule of thumb where if you were dealing with optical light, the uh, smallest angular separation, R, was 11.6 divided by D, where D was the diameter in centimetres. I think, in fact, he used inches, and this has been up-converted to centimetres to be a little bit more up-to-date. But uh, anyway, so if you work that out for typical telescopes, so it's a picture of my uh, new telescope, and my son and the older 10-inch telescope stood on the floor next to it. So if we had a 75 millimeter three 3-inch telescope, Dawes limit tells us that the best we can do is 
arc seconds, go to an 8 inch 200 millimeter telescope, drops to 0.58 of an arc second. Um, and if you happen to have the Keck 10 meter telescope in your backyard, you could get to uh, 0.0116 arc seconds. So that would be enough to be able to generate an image of something um, if it were not for all of the atmospheric turbulence, uh, which, as I said, limits the observations to about 0.3 of an arc second. Now, there are things you can do about that, and we'll come on to those. But just before we move on away from the pure do doors limit, I've got a little comment for you, which is a question that I sometimes get asked. So how big a telescope would you need in order to be able to see the stars and stripes on the moon? And if you plug in the numbers, you can work out what the diameter of the uh, telescope mirror you would need in order to get an image of the flag would be. And the answer is that it would need to be 25 kilometers across absolutely enormous, a thousand times bigger and, and more than the largest telescope that's operational at the moment in terms of optical telescopes. Um, we are building some that are up to 40 metres, um, so we'll only be a factor of uh, uh, several hundred away from being able to do this. But we can do better. A technique that was pioneered here in Cambridge by Martin Ryle, back after the Second World War with a lot of surplus uh, radio equipment and radar equipment. He was able to set up the Mullard uh, Radio Telescope Observatory, which is shown against the night sky in the bottom picture there with uh, several of the radio dishes. You've got the 4C array on the right there, which is a great big long instrument that uh, could only be moved in one axis and relied on the Earth's rotation in the other. And then you've got uh, dishes from the one mile and the half mile long arrays. And it was those half mile and mile long arrays that were the first where the signals were captured in several dishes, brought together and combined to make high resolution pictures. Now, you can do that with radio waves because the wavelength is very long. The frequency is therefore low and low enough that the computer technology that was just beginning to emerge in Ryle's time was able to track the phase. He could use uh, uh, valve-based equipment to be able to bring the phase of the signals from the different telescopes together. And you have to get that phase right, otherwise the image is going to uh, scramble itself and cancel out. Um, and, of course, this is why it's much easier with longer wavelengths, uh, lower frequencies. We still can't really do this uh, with optical equipment. Our computers are just not fast enough for the extraordinary high frequency of optical light. Now, the two pictures at the top there are of the uh, image of a black hole, and the accretion disk around it, which was made by the Event Horizon Telescope. And that's not one telescope, that's radio telescopes, in fact, from the locations all over the world, making the effect of one very, very large Earth-sized telescope able to capture at extraordinary detail. So uh, if you plugged the uh, size of the Earth into your appropriate doors limit, you could work out what the resolution would be. Now, of course, actually, with longer wavelengths, the uh, doors limit has to be corrected because you have to really divide by the wavelength of the light in performing the calculation. So you can end up uh, dividing by uh, the much longer waves of radio and find that the limit's not going to be as good. So um, there's a trade-off to be had here. But really what we needed to do was to bring together optical images from separated small mirrors. And that was first done using COAST, the Cambridge Optical Aperture Synthesis Telescope, which is this instrument in the top picture, which looks like a set of beehives, really. But it's actually four mirrors that are uh, one meter sized mirrors and can be moved around up to 100 metres apart. 
It's on the Mallard site. You can see one of the radio telescopes just peeking into the picture in the background there. Um, but the white units contain the mirrors. That captures the inf information and the light, sends it down the tubes, and then those tubes emerge into the secret underground laboratory, which looks like something out of James Bond. And this is a photo that I took on a visit there a few years ago. Uh, of the optical bench, you can see there are four channels. The images from the mirrors come in down those channels, and then they are corrected. There's lots of computer equipment that is able to bring the images together and combine them to produce an extraordinarily sharp picture. And in fact, the image there in orange, that's the star Capella, which is shown as two separate components here, which was the first time these two components had been split and imaged by an optical instrument. Um, and the resolution is with this down to a thousandth of an arc second. And it's also able to correct for the atmospheric turbulence. The mirrors are fairly small, and so the column of light that each is looking through is not particularly subject to too much turbulence. And the difference between the turbulence in the different images is such that um, it's able to be corrected by the optical path that's trying to sort out the phase anyway. So it's a combination of aperture synthesis and adaptive optics, to use the terminology. And so this is a, a technique that's now been widely adopted. The VLT in Chile has four seven meter dishes separated and able to operate as one optical interferometer. Um, and this technique is uh, being used elsewhere as well. And so just to wrap up with Epsilon Lyra, we've looked at the double-double and the fifth component. And in fact, there are more stars listed as possibly being associated with the double-double, potentially five more. These are much fainter, magnitude 10 all the way down to magnitude 14. And we're not sure if they're actually associated with this uh, grouping in space or whether it's a line of sight effect. So uh, watch this space. We may get more information on that as we go forward. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed that trip once around Epsilon Lyra, the double-double, and I hope you get out and have a look at it. Thanks. Bye.